Uh, so today is the last day of lecture, so we'll do a review for the final exam. Um, and yeah, let's get right into it. So, like, all right. So first up, um, this is kind of a detail of the final exam. I probably should change the title from announcements. It's really about the final exam. Um, so just to clarify, it's on Wednesday, not Tuesday or Thursday. I know for the longest time I was thinking it was on Tuesday, so I uh, just want to clarify that it is on Wednesday on the 10th. Uh, it will be in this room, uh, unless they're doing the alternative final exam, and that will be on Monday. And if you signed up for the alternative final exam, you should have a calendar invite from me with a room location. Uh, if you do not have that and think you are taking the alternative exam, uh, please see me after class because you are currently incorrect. Um, so let's just make sure we have everybody correctly. Um, it covers the whole semester, but with a focus on since the midterm, I think I've mentioned before. Uh, it is open web, but there will be no written materials. Okay, so apologies if you prefer to have written notes or something uh, to review. Uh, we it's too hard in here to do something like that. So uh, a couple of notes about this. Um, you will not allow to have any electronics besides your computer. Okay, so. If you have headphones, say, around your neck right now, uh, not that I am noticing anybody in particular, or in your ears, those will be a problem. Okay, so just when you kind of get here, put all that stuff in your bag, um, and, you know, just realize that, it, like I have had to talk to a student who had uh, earbuds in their ear, I will consider that cheating and instantly fail you. Okay, so let's not do that. Um, so that's the, the first thing. But the other big thing too is that you won't have two references. You'll just have your computer, you know, switch tabs, do whatever, but just uh, you won't have like if you like to use a tablet combined with a laptop or something like that. That's not going to work out for this thing. Um, make sure you bring a computer that is fully charged. It, I actually have had a student in this class in the past who actually did all of their work on a tablet. That's totally fine. It's just you're limited to a single device. If you really want to do the entire thing on your phone, feel free. Okay, it's just, you can only use one device, whatever device that is. Um, and just make sure it has a good battery. The other thing is we've had multiple problems in the past with um, being able to start Jupyter Notebooks kind of all at once. Okay, so please, please, please uh, try to start your Jupyter Notebook instance earlier in the day. It can be 45 minutes earlier. It can be eight hours earlier. Um, just make sure you set the timing rights, the math works. But beyond that, but just please don't do it in here because invariably we will have problems, okay? So just start it off, validate that it's running, uh, and then you should be fine for the final exam. But like I said, we've had lots of problems in the past, so let's not have that this time. Um, oh, and I don't think I'm the last line is the single device. Uh, any questions? This is kind of about the format, right? It's just going to be a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, there will be a mix of questions, so it will be like, um, you know, the homework, and actually my strong recommendation is if you look at homework eight in particular, actually, rather than even though it's weirdly, we're also doing a nine, but eight in particular, if you do homework eight, and if you do that with no reference, you're pretty much ready for the exam, okay? That's the vast majority of, of what will be best on there, with the exception of a few questions that are like definition type questions. I'll probably have an ethics question. Um, you know, some, some things like that, so kind of knowledge questions rather than coding questions. But the vast majority of it is coding similar to each uh, homework. Yeah. Example. Yeah, I think I have some. I'm mean, going to go through a bunch of different ones. Um, so I don't know if I have an actual example. Remind me again when we get to the ethics part if, there's, if I don't have one. I can't remember. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, now we're going to pause in the regular schedule programming and ask you to do surveys. Okay, there's a lot of that. Oh, there's two. So I'm going to leave the room. I'm going to give you like 15 minutes uh, to do the force and bow. Um, and then I would also like it if you did this ES100 final survey. Um, both I use that for feedback from the class, but I also use it um, to generate data to use in class. Uh, so please fill it out. Um, and, you know, take it as seriously as possible. I think one of the questions is, you know, um, which way do you look before you cross the street, for example? Uh, and if you're a Bostonian, 
uh, you should always check both ways, irrelevant of one way signs. Um, so QR codes, but those are the links if you want to type them in. Um, and you know, obviously just aim correctly. And then lastly, here, this is purely optional. Um, oh, I meant to put up here too. Um, so there's the course assistance, but CDS, the like the group is also hiring. So if you go to the CDS website, there's a uh, like a, a hiring form there if you want to do that for the fall. Uh, lots of different kinds of jobs from working kind of front that to I don't know other stuff. Um, there's the course assistance, and then there's also the Spark application form if you want to do anything like a Spark project in the fall, or if you want to get involved with Spark. How many people here know what Spark is? Have I talked about it? Oh, so not very many. Okay, so Spark is a program within uh, CBS that is focused on experiential learning. So let's say you want to, you know, when you're a senior, you want to work on a project in, say, data science, but with a third party. So like some outside organization, you want to do a real world project. Well, Spark provides classes and internships that will let you do that. Okay. But in order to kind of get to that point, there's lots of other jobs as well. So there's ambassadors for Spark, so that's basically community building, um, also focused on things like micro challenges. So building tools for people to learn little bits and pieces. Uh, there's also things about um, uh, diversity and inclusion so that to try to make sure that Spark is as inclusive and welcoming a, a group as possible, but there's jobs dedicated to working on that front. Um, in fact, one of the people who did that actually started a two credit class about DEI and tech. Um, as well as the climate survey that I think I advertised in this class uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so there's the, like the ambassador jobs, which is kind of community building. There's project managers. There's technical engineers that are kind of support structure for the projects. There's internships on actual projects. And then there's also classes where you can work on projects. Um, so if you haven't been to like a Spark info session, I strongly recommend it. But Spark also hires a ton of students. Um, so if you go to the CES website, all that stuff is linked there as well, uh, or the Spark website. Um, and then this is specifically just about the course assistant uh, jobs. Okay, so if any of you want to get involved in anything related to data science or experiential learning, we actually have a lot of jobs uh, that are you know on campus, relatively lightweight, forgiving for the fact that you have midterms and finals, um, unlike your average job down the street. Any questions? Right. We usually have the Spark ambassadors come into my class and tell everybody about Spark, but I don't think we've managed to do it this semester. All right, so I'm going to go away for like 15 minutes. Uh, like I said, please definitely fill out the first two forms. Feel free to fill out the course if there's one. Up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, okay. I didn't give it out yet. I'm going to say, I'm
tell you all uh, that if you got done early, you should check out there's a new game where you have to guess whether or not it's a human or an AI. Have you seen this game? Uh, it's kind of hilarious. Uh, my son told me about it. I definitely recommend checking it out. It's kind of freaky. Um, so two things. It's always nice when you get to pause in the middle of something you say, because then you can remember things that you forgot. So I wanted to mention with Spark, uh, there's two things, or a big aspect that I didn't really mention is that it's not just for tech students. Um, it's also other uh, other kind of majors or disciplines as well. Uh, so, for example, one of the other class I teach right now is Data Science for Good, which is an SEC class, uh, which is a combination of social science and data science. And that class is focused on uh, right now is focused on data science and criminal justice, and uh, specifically looking at how to increase transparency for the Boston Police. Uh, so in that class, right, we need to have people who are good at kind of social science research, as well as students who are good at, um, you know, writing a web page, as well as people who are good at um, manipulating data. So that's kind of one XC class. There's another XC class called the Justice Media Collab, which is a similar concept, except it's the combination of journalism and data science. So what's called data-driven journalism and uh, researching various uh, topics. Um, as instructed by places like the Boston Globe, like the editor of the Globe, calls um, the, the journalism person who's one of the instructors and says, hey, we really like the students to look into this, right? Uh, and then you go and try to find a story there. And most of the time we find something, uh, but there's been like front page Globe articles uh, from that class, for example. Um, and so we do, we do have in Spark programs uh, a lot of opportunities for people who are not necessarily tech people, um, but then also stuff in tech. So if you are not a data science or computer science major, you should still check out Spark. There might be some things. Any questions? All right. So uh, you've seen some of these slides before. Actually, probably all. Of them. I mean, theoretically, you've seen all these slides before. Um, but I wanted to kind of give a little bit of an overview of what um, I'm expecting to cover in the final exam. Now, right, the final exam is not 30 hours long, okay? So it will not actually cover all of these things, but these are all the things that could be covered. So these are the things you should know, okay? Um, and what I wanna highlight in particular is these last two, okay? So conceptually, you should know something about the ethics stuff and conceptually, you should know something about classifiers, but you won't have too much like kind of I don't know, hard testing on that. Um, it's more the concepts than it is the uh, being able to like build a class time. Um, but all the rest of this stuff is definitely fair game. Okay, so if you don't know what any of those things mean, you should go and review that. Um, the videos uh, of the lecture are in the works right now going up for the rest of the month that's not there. Um, and they should all be up with any luck, they'll be up before reading period actually starts, which I think it's technically Thursday, um, but you know, with any luck, we'll have some of them off today, more of them dropping tomorrow. Uh, so those are all there. The slides should already be all posted. Uh, if they're not, uh, let us know at the outset if, we're, if we missed one or something, certainly possible. Uh, grades also should be all current and updated. 
uh, for everything that's been graded. There's a like there's like a lab maybe or maybe one homework that's not graded yet, um, but everything else should be there. You should be getting a pretty accurate description of what your class overall grade is in Blackboard right now. Um, it, it will it does take into account that you did not get a zero on homework nine. It just doesn't calculate it right because it hasn't been graded yet. Um, the reason I say it's a it's an approximation, right? Is because you still have the final exam, which is actually not a huge portion of your grade. I want to say it's twenty percent. I don't know. I changed it this semester to make it less, and I can't remember exactly what I changed it to. Um, but it shouldn't have too huge an impact, I hope. Um, and keep in mind, part of the reason we do so many homeworks and labs is to try to even them out, right? So that if you don't do great for one of them, it's hopefully offset by the others that you were done. Um, so it should be pretty close, uh, but you have at least one homework left. I want to say there's a lab that you graded, there's the final exam, and then there's participation, right? So attendance and participation, as you can look around the room, we're missing like a third of the class. Um, so I know we've been doing the attendance on Piazza. Um, I'm also going to be using intelligence to figure out whether or not people are actually here if they're, if we're cheating all the way along and trying to wreck the attendance system. Um, hopefully we'll be able to take that into account. Uh, participation is also a uh, part of your grade. So if you're participating in class, you're participating in labs, you're coming by office hours and talking to people, those are all things that uh, are included in the participation grade. Um, usually attendance and participation um, can kind of shift you into the next level grade or the next down grade. It doesn't normally have a negative impact. Normally it's a positive impact. Any questions? Yeah. Um, for the Piazza, they're like out of different amounts of points. Like some will be out of 10 and some will be out of 80. Yep. Those weighted or is it? No, it's just, they're just needed out because what happens is like you got 80% uh, out of the whatever. So they go in as um, the total score against your score. So they just average out. But all the homeworks are graded, are weighted equally, all the labs are weighted equally. Any other questions? Uh, I did see there was someone uh, somewhere asked me if we might drop the lowest grade from the homeworks. Um, it's technically, it's not in the syllabus, it is not there. Uh, if I find that it makes a material impact to kind of a lot of people in the class, I'll post a Piazza announcement that I'm going to do it and drop it. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Um, but I generally, you know, I, I like to encourage everyone to do, like I said, at the beginning of the semester, and I say pretty regularly, the only way you can learn this stuff is practice. You just have to practice. Um, and that's the big thing that happens with both the midterm and the final exam is people aren't fast enough because they don't have enough practice, okay? So there's actually not that much work in them, but because you aren't practicing it enough, um, you're not fast enough. Yeah? Mm. Well, I know we've been like reading the homework. Are there any other resources of like, you have to practice more? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> so, um, here are some other resources. Uh, so there's kind of stuff we produce. Um, I also strongly encourage a Google search for data science, you know, correlation, right? Um, as I think I've said to all of you before, um, you know, I think I'm pretty good at talking about a lot of this stuff, but sometimes people, you just don't get it when the way I explain it for whatever reason, go find somebody else that explains it. Go find a classmate to explain it. Go ask one of the CAs to explain it. Um, if you just hear it from a different source, it may be enough to get it, it to click in your brain. Um, so, you can find tons of resources. Data science is the hottest thing since life bread right now. There are tons of resources on the internet. Most of them are reasonably good. Um, you know, I won't say they're things always perfect, but they're usually pretty good. Um, and try to think reputable sources, right? I'm a huge fan of Khan Academy. Um, the there's also this class is based on a class out of Berkeley called Data 8, um, that has lots of their lectures online as well. Um there's another one. Oh, uh, towards data science uh, is really good. That might be a little bit advanced for a lot of the stuff that we've been doing, um, but they have really good content. So hopefully by now, most of you were either taught in high school or have learned through your own experience how to find credible sources on the internet, right? It's the only way to learn anything anymore in a sense. Um, so your ability to discern that this is a good quality product and that is a bad product uh, is very, very important. 
Um, if you want advice on that, feel free to come by. Or if you're not sure, but, you know, if you found something you're like, does this look like a good resource? Feel free to let us know and ask us. And we'll maybe add it to the list. We started working on a list this semester of kind of outside resources, but didn't get as far as we would have liked. Uh, there was a lot going on. So lecture video. Oh, shoot. That URL is incorrect. It is correct on Piazza, though. Uh, so ignore that one. Um, I'll try to update it before it goes on the notes. Um, any notes you've taken, lecture notebooks. Um, you know, again, if you did if you missed class or you didn't get the whole lecture notebook, feel free to come by. We'll let you review it while we're sitting there. Um, and you can correct anything you might be missing. Oh, and sorry, there's a final exam review guide. Um, I'm hoping it's got some problems, so I need to fix it before it can go live. Um, I forgot that it had bugs in it, so I just need to correct it. So hopefully that'll I'll release that before a reading period as well. Oh, sorry. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I, I I talked to yeah I talked to Ron about it. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Hopefully it'll be up by Wednesday. Yeah. Um. And sorry, I thought I had my slides out of order. Um, I thought this was the one after the next one. So the final exam is likely just kind of one, like the, the coding part of it is likely kind of just one question. Okay. And that one question might be something like these. Okay. Um, you know, maybe pare down. What I do try to do with the final exam is like, you know, there's various steps, right, that you go through. So I'll try to provide you. The correct answer before the next step. So even if you got the prior question wrong, it doesn't cascade. But these are the kinds of things you should think about. Um, oh, I, I knew there were updates. I didn't make this slide. Okay, uh, the workplace in Germany was not homework nine this semester. Um, uh, it's a different, but that was one of the prior homework in prior semester. Um, but so. But the you know kind of the concept is the same, okay. And so I talked about I think I talked in this class about uh, you can go and get big belly uh, data, uh, you know those big trash cans you see all over the place, like where they are in the city, and correlating that to uh, where blue bike stations are might be an interesting question. Another one is uh, three hundred one requests. You all know what three hundred one is. We talked about that in here. Is there anybody know what three hundred one is? Okay. So 311 is non-emergency city services. So like you see a pothole, you call 311 and say, there's a pothole here, please fix. Uh, or a street light is out. There's an app, there's a phone number, et cetera. Um, but there's very city-based, so Boston has one. They are, there are thousands of them. There's really interesting equity issues with 311 as well, um, where you see in really rich neighborhoods, 311 reports come in a lot and they get fixed a lot. And in poor neighborhoods, they don't come in very often and they don't get fixed very often. So it's uh, interesting research there. Um, and then another one, for example, we can all the permits about construction are public. So what if we go grab all the permits? Could we say you should live in Arlington because it has no construction? Okay. And anybody live in Arlington? Really? Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, so Arlington, uh, South Boston, where I live, uh, are some of the worst for homes and construction all the time. All right, so those are some examples. Uh, plots and scatters, as you all know, one of my favorite pet peeves or whatever is uh, getting the right kind of graphs. Um, when you use a line versus scatter plot, so uh, you use lines for sequential data and scatters for non sequential data. So if you want to do a comparison of two points, uh, that's usually scatter. And I would say the vast majority of the time, you're kind of using scatters, and then maybe next is like histograms. Uh, so those are the ones to know really well. Um, bar chart versus histogram. I think you all know what this is. Um, distribution of categorical variable versus distribution of numerical variable. Um, and so basically what you're doing is turning a, a number or a numerical value right into a category by putting them in bins. And that's what a histogram essentially is doing. But it has these advantages. The reason that it's basically a bar chart, right? But it has some advantages because it is numbers. So therefore, you can do math with it, right? All right, sampling. Uh, sampling is incredibly important, okay? Especially uh, random, sampler, uh, random samples 
and ensuring that the randomness that you think is there is actually there. Okay, that is a really important <laughs> criteria. It's really important that you understand and document whenever you're doing random sampling, how you're getting to your randomness. Um, and also, this is, I think, a common misunderstanding is that just because it's random doesn't mean that you can't have percentages or a distribution, right? So we talked about uh, jury, uh, jury member selection about in two different scenarios. Both of those had um, not equal chances for any individual being selected, right? Um, yeah, but it's really important you know what the probability of any individual is. Or individual group, I guess. And a deterministic example, sorry, uh, is also important, but is way less common, right? Because usually what you're trying, the point you're trying to prove usually relies on random sample. Uh, and then sample convenience, just you off that sample. Now be really careful that you the sample you're collecting is distributed the way you think it is. Either it's deterministic or it's random. Right, but if it's kind of maybe somewhere in the middle, that's usually a bad sign. Okay, and making sure that that's true is very hard. Um, how many people have been approached from the survey on the street about, for example, how stressed you are, which is a cover for the Church of uh, Scientology. Uh, okay, you haven't seen them. They're often down near the T stations, um, but they interestingly. Are doing a sampling of convenience, but are clearly targeting certain people or certain types of people, right? So if you see a whole bunch of people walk by them, they will only talk to certain people out of that line, right? Um, you see the same kind of thing, but maybe with less questionable purposes. With organizations like Greenpeace, they used to do, they don't do it as much anymore, they used to do a ton of convenience sampling on the street. Um, but these, these are kind of interesting is that if you watch people who are like taking surveys on the street, watch them for a little bit, see how they're taking their sample. Are they only targeting certain races? Are they only targeting, um, you know, certain socioeconomic class? Why are they doing it? Right? It'd be really, really interesting. Uh, these are the functions that you use for these tools or these things. Uh, so they're really important to know because they're really common, right? Um, this is the right. So you use random choice and with a pen, and then uh, to do the sampling. Um, and it's really, really important that you know what the defaults are or are very explicit every time. So, for example, I had a student come by the other day with the office hours and chose uh, was trying to do um, bootstrap sampling, uh, and they had only chosen a limited set of the sample that they were pulling. That they were pulling. So just be careful of that kind of thing that you know. Kind of which flags you should be setting to accomplish which method. Okay. Um, and then it's really important to know what the null and the alternative hypotheses are and what they what that means. Okay. Um, and be able to create one. Okay. But they're usually pretty easy, right? Um, you know, it's just what is it you want to know, right? And then the opposite. Okay. Whichever one is the null is the thing you're going to test, whether it's what you agree with or don't agree. Uh, the p-value is also important. Um, so basically what this is going to do is, is tell us whether we're in the null range, right, or in the alternative range. Because of randomness, we don't we expect them to overlap slightly. Uh, and so the size of that overlap is what we call the confidence interval, and the p value is kind of where in that overlap you might be. Uh, p value is actually called the real name of it is the observed significance level. Um, and all these things are true about it. Um, and so your test statistic basically, this is what you're looking at, right? Like this is what you're trying to figure out, except it's calculated, okay? So this, this value doesn't appear in the population, right? Because this is subtraction. So therefore, it doesn't appear in the population. All right, shuffling. Um, I really think this one's really interesting, really useful. Um, so this is like, you think you have a causal relationship, for example, between whether the mother smoked and whether they have babies who have lower birth weights. So you think there's a cause, 
causal relationship. So what you do is you shuffle the smoking so that it doesn't become part of the equation and see if it goes, if your relationship goes away. Okay, so you determine that the maternal, uh, you know, maternal smokers have lower birth weights. Okay, but now you want to know if that's causal. Well, then what you do is get basically make the smoking random. That's what shuffling labels really does. Uh, and see if it's still true. If it's still true, there's some other factor that you're not accounting for. If the correlation has gone away, that means that the maternal smoker was the reason. Okay. And so this is kind of the you know, approach to doing shuffling. So you shuffle the group labels, you pick which group you want, right? And, and then kind of shuffle it around. You know, you should only be doing one column, generally speaking, only one column kind of at a time, um, at least at this level. And then you assign each shuffle lab label to a birth weight in this case, and then the difference between the average of the two shuffle groups. But because you want to make sure that you didn't get a really weird shuffle result, you do it a bunch of times to control for any weirdness and randomness, okay? Because it could very well be, right, when you shuffle those, whether they smoke or not labels, you got back exactly the same thing, right? It's certainly possible, unlikely, but it's possible. So you want to make sure you do it a bunch of times so that you can control for weirdness in how the shuffling happens. Easy. All right, bootstrap, I think a picture. Um, so bootstrap is basically when you don't have the full population or suspect you don't have the full population, you have a sample of it. So what you do is you sample the whole, the whole population that you have, right? The whole sample, but with replacement. So in other words, you can get the same row again um, and do that a bunch of times. And then calculate your staff off of that. Um, and so, you know, the part that is interesting, right, is that it's this part, right? Is that we hope that this will be true. And in future data science classes, you can do some of the math to prove whether or not or how true it is. Um, but generally speaking, if you're kind of following the rules, you will you will end up with something that is probably true. Okay. Um, so it's just this goes into account of like, did you have a big enough original sample? Or did you take enough resamples? That kind of thing. Um, but for the sake of this class, you can assume it works, right? As long as you kind of follow the directions. All right, so you draw it random with replacement as many values as the original sample contain. Uh, and then this is our confidence in our answer. So I talked about this a little bit with the p-value, but your cutoff is 5%, and then all the hypothesis happens to be true. Um, then there's a 5% chance that your test will reject the null hypothesis. So it's it's weird here, right? Because we're we're testing for and looking at and all that other jazz, the null hypothesis. But a lot of the time, we're expecting the alternative to be true. And so that 5%, we talk about it in terms of the alternative, right? So like we're still in the alternative even if we're 5% of the way into the null, okay? So it, that's why I think this is, it can be very confusing, is because we, like I said, all of the math, all of the work around a variable is centered around the null because that's the only thing we can test. But all of the kind of output results or whatever is we talk about it in terms of the alternative. Because it's usually the alternative that we're expecting to be true. Or commonly, let's put that on. Not usually. Uh, p value cutoff versus the p value. I talked about this a little bit already. Uh, and then I, like I said, I put this together to try to make it a little easier to map what you're trying to accomplish to what approach. And then we get into linear association. So um, when you are doing correlations and you want to try to do, especially when you want to get into linear regression, you want to do some sort of prediction. Um, and so in order to do that, I think I will. yeah, so, uh, so what we use is standard deviation, uh, to try to get a sense of variability. Okay. So we might start off with very big standard deviations. Um, and so we'll do things like convert it to standard units to simplify it. Um, a bunch of different things like that, but that standard deviation kind of tells us the distribution of the data within the set. 
So, for example, in grade scope or whenever I see one of your homeworks, I get a standard deviation, right? It calculates it for me and presents it as the standard deviation. So I know because what I want for the class, right, is I want the whole class to be roughly consolidated around one grade. And then depending on how I want the class to perform, I want that grade to be an A or a B or a C or whatever, right? But if I have a class where the where everyone, you know, homework, you know, three, uh, there's a standard deviation that's really big, that probably means there's something wrong either with the homework or how we taught it, right? Because if it's really inconsistent, so that's what the standard deviation tells me is that my results are really inconsistent. So there's something probably broken. Right? Does that make sense? So the standard deviation can be really useful to kind of understand the like the layout of the thing, right? And so I'll I use that data to figure out, like I said, if the if the exam or the you know the homework is broken, or if how we taught something was broken, and maybe we should revisit some subject matter. Um, but then I also use like the mean and median to also get a sense of where the class is. And I want all the grades to be clustered around some particular grade. Um, and generally for this class, I do it at relatively high end. I want most of the grades to be around B, maybe even an A, depending on what it is. Um, and I don't want wild just, uh, standard deviations. Um, and so, yeah, so just kind of in further detail, right, the significance of the um, kind of data from the average. And this is just how you calculate it. And yeah, all right, correlation coefficient, another very useful metric. I mean, it's, you know, as soon as you it's like this kind of goes with like math and science kind of in general is that if you see something that's kind of explained once and then uh, they just always use like the the initial right so p value for example or r and that's all you ever see again it means that thing is ridiculously important right in that subject area or whatever it is um, so because we just throw around r after my initial discussion that's a pretty big hint that this is a very important thing. Does that make sense? But you definitely can use that information in basically any science or math uh, that you're doing later. Um, it might be true in like social sciences too. I don't know. I didn't do it in social sciences. All right. So this is just how you calculate the correlation coefficient. And then we have a linear regression. So it all comes down to basically how do you calculate the formula for a line? And then how do we get the pieces that we need to be able to do the calculation? So how do we get to the slope? How do we get to the intercept? Uh, so that we can multiply it by our input, and our input is the x, right? It's always the x, even if you want the thing that's the y, you reverse, you kind of invert your, your data set so that it's always the x. Okay, otherwise people will get confused. That's by convention, not because the math does work. But so here's how we get the slope and the intercept. Um, and why do we care about standard deviation so much? Um, you know, it's because we need them, and because why do we need the standard? Yeah, so yeah, whatever. Um, but so we need that for the correlation, we need the standard deviation, um, and we can do averages and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, what we're really trying to get to is the formula for our line, and then we have to be able to build the pieces so that we can calculate y based on x. Right. Oh, and actually, one thing which I don't think we've mentioned really in this class, but you'll see it if you're reading other things about the subject, is that the slope and the intercept are often just referred to as the coefficients. Okay, because they're so common that, of course, they're those coefficients. If you know what the term coefficient means, it just means the static part of any formula. But when you're talking about any of this stuff, it's those coefficients they're talking about. All right, and then least squares. Uh, so this is just kind of how, okay, so now we got a line, great. What we want to know is based on our test data, or initially we'll even go with our training data to make sure that our regression line is decent, we got to calculate the errors. And basically what we do to calculate the errors is subtract, okay? We take the Y value you generated compared to the original and subtract those. 
except we do some modifications to it to control for uh, like negative numbers and basically to, to like I said, to kind of uh, reinforce the amount of error of a big error um, so that it kind of becomes more important. So that's why we're doing the summing and the swearing and the, um, if that are, well, really the swearing and the averages. Um, and then the important one here is that root mean square error. You will see mean square error, but it's really unusual. It's almost always hard to see. Um, and then these are some terms. So if you see best fit line or least squares line or regression line, they all mean the same thing. We're talking about that, that linear regression. All right. And then residuals, this is kind of how we, this is kind of the term we use when we're saying what's the, what's the leftovers when we're looking for those distances. Okay, so it's like the error is kind of the subtraction and the, the leftover is the residual. Uh, and so when you're looking at a plot of the residuals, it should look like a block. Okay, so kind of the opposite of what we expect for a correlation. And these are some of the properties. Uh, and then talking about classifiers. So basically, like I said, conceptually, regression is around numerics, right? And classification is around categories. So, you know, this is why we want to say, okay, based on these methods, we want to recommend another watch. Um, you know, we kind of, it's, they're really about categories. It's really very similar to doing linear regression. It's just that kind of the, the goal is different. Um, so, but this is what classifiers are about. Like I said, we're not going to test too much on this, um, but you kind of end up with all of your mechanisms for prediction, okay? So linear regression or a classifier or whatever, so you kind of have this big box up here that does the magic, okay? In the case of linear regression, it does, you know, basically calculates a Y on the slope and the intercept, right? Um, in the case of a classifier, it figures out which one, which grouping this item is closest to. Um, but so there's that big box and then out comes your prediction. Okay, so you kind of have to know, depending on what you want to accomplish, what you want to predict, you got to know what has to go in the box. Right? But the box is across different uh, goal, like across different uh, data sets are the same. So like a linear regression is a linear regression. It doesn't matter what the data is, right? Classifier is similar, okay? Or using like uh, nearest neighbor classifiers, for example, or as you get more advanced k means classifiers, et cetera. They're, the, the method is the same to the inputs and then obviously the outputs are good. Even if you get to the point of doing like neural networks, it's the same. You just have this box that you feed all your inputs into and out comes the output. All right, and then ethics. Um, so you should have reviewed, to look familiar, you should have reviewed something like uh, like kind of a form that you would fill out um, based on like an ethical audit. You know, in my opinion, you know, uh, you should know this kind of ethical audit kind of idea well enough that you never look at the form again. Um, not for necessarily this exam, but kind of in general, you should have a good idea. These are the kinds of questions you should be asking yourself whenever you're, you're especially if you're doing data. Um, and so that's what uh, I can never say the name. Oh, I guess I don't know. I'm not Spanish. Um, so uh, what he was talking about, right? So and then, but the but this is what I really like in this slides. Um, this is the slide he showed you, right? I'll play a stripper from the right class. Did you just see this slide? Yes. No. Anyone? All right, all right. So I might have pulled it from a different one, uh, but hopefully, he, I mean, he usually talks about this, even if he didn't throw the slide up. But the final takeaway, right, is like your gut is probably right, okay? Let listen to it, okay? Especially when you're dealing with this stuff, because you have you have a magic skill, right? Um, so going back to someone's question of like an example of the ethics question, um, I don't have one. Uh, so what I was going to say was that. What I was expecting that the question might be is like, here is a scenario. Give me a paragraph about what I should be concerned about for an ethical perspective. So kind of like a case study, um, but relatively short. That makes sense. 
All right, I need to stop and say his name like 16 more times, like in my ear, and then hopefully I'll get it one of these days. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, any questions? Like I said, we'll post these so you can cross reference them. Um, uh, any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, do you know what? So, is this the study guide? Um, right. Or like the slides are the slides of study guide, or would it be like no? There's a separate dump that uh, I want to make sure is right before it gets posted, and it had some problems, and I didn't get a chance to review it. When will that be posted? So if we post it at all, assuming it's not completely broken, it'll be there by the end of the day when it's set. Okay. Well, On the awesome. And it's open. The, the final is open computer. Right? And we yeah. Can anything else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or the internet, yeah. which is not running on computer. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, what was the range? Is it out of the two to 32? Yeah, uh, let's go with uh, 16. Uh, what was the, the opposite code? 16. Okay. Oh, did you just say that? Yeah, yeah. Good. literally. That's not literally said it before. Well, the language gives fans fills like three to five plot, or would it be like the length of the class? Um, I try to write the final exam that if somebody knew the stuff cold, it'll take them half an But it's it's tough. But yes, the expectation is that you're going to not as Yeah. I'm <laughs> 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 